Hello ladies and gents, boys and girls, my good people out there. Welcome to another episode of the Sit Down with me, Daddy Say. I'm privileged today and very much honored to talk to Dr. Ajak Duany Ojak, who is based in Australia. Welcome Dr. Ajak. Uh thanks uh Daddy. Uh it's my privilege to be on your platform. He holds a PhD in mining and metallurgical uh, engineering from Curtin University. He has many other qualifications which he'll get to talk to us about. He has worked in various capacities with some of the world's top mining conglomerates including Rio Tinto, BHP and many others. He's a community leader. He continues to support many programs in his community in Australia and in his home country of South Sudan. Ajak is passionate about education which led him to initiate a program in South Sudan of setting up a technical college called Dufiko Polytechnic which he'll talk to us about. He's a father, he's a husband, he's a leader and he's a clergyman in his community. Uh thanks daddy and uh to the audience of Sit Down with Daddy. Uh as daddy has already mentioned my name is Jack Duanya Jack. I'm a South Sudanese by origin. I live now in Perth, Western Australia. Daddy and I part ways in 2006. We were on the same program called uh, WUSC, World University Service for Canada. I hope I still remember the name. Yes. And Daddy went to Canada, I came to Australia. But before we found ourselves in the camp, uh, we came from different part of South Sudan and I'm from Bor originally. Uh Dinka uh, by ethnicity. And uh but the main thing I'm proud of Sudan is uh when the daddy introduced me he, he mentioned the salutations as a doctor yes i it has been a privilege to, to get access to high education and i had a phd in mining and electrical engineering yes i'm still practicing in the industry but i okay. also in, involved in the research work uh okay. so by profession i can call myself a mining engineer and a data scientist I yes. had a lot to do with uh, AI and machine learning. So okay. uh, that is education background and I work in mining sector as well as in research and in the education. So that's I think that's a brave part. If you want to ask more, I'm more than happy to answer the specific but I hope uh, uh that is what I can say at this stage. Okay, yeah, that that's fine for now. I know if if I ask you a you phd people will start throwing big big books at us so <laughs> i think that's good enough can you share a moment in your education journey which has been a major factor that has cha- uh, charted or has shaped your life so far um that is a great question daddy and uh, sometimes i think i always wonder if i look along my timeline yes of studies from primary all the way Yes. Uh, to the PhD and uh, until now I I can say it, um it was at the early stages uh in 1989 when I start uh, under a tree in a small court center in Bor okay. and and I was in the club one of the a, a journalist now who is based in Australia called uh, David Janko Jack the youth up scene Some of his show on SBS Dinka. Is, is, is that a jack? Sorry, is that a jack? Yes, a jack. Okay. So th- that that moment when we started under the tree and getting introduced to uh, the English alphabet, okay. we were scripting it on the ground on the mat. Yes. It 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 shows something that at least a word. and the communication could be modeled in symbols and those mm-hmm. symbols become letters and letters become words and words become sentences and there you go a full mm-hmm. communication to me i still consider it, it is a important moment uh, that is the first time i got introduced full out of kettle camps into under uh, a open air class under the tree i think yes. that to me is the most important one oh, okay And and did you did you receive any of those half pencils and half books that they used to give out back in the day? <laughs> yes, and I think that actually it, it took six months before I received those things. Oh, okay. We when we were scratching the ground. Yes. To map out letters. Yes. But 
Even before then, I was able to ride Dinka. Okay. I learned Dinka at a very early age. Okay. In, in the church. Okay. So, but then some letters were not matching. But yet, okay. you have to demonstrate that you can write English alphabet. So, it, it from September, I remember until somewhere in March. Yes. In a different school, that's when I used to sit. Uh, you, you know, the, the, exor- the exercise book uh, it was always there in a A4 size paper. And yes. they have to cut into three for three, into two actually, because it is pin at, at one side and, and there is also pin at the other end. So they cut mm-hmm. in the middle side that the pin <laughs> holding the paper together become one exercise book. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and a B2 pencil will be cut into two, three, depending on the population. Yes, I did. I see it. Yes. I still remember it very well. Yeah. It's called maximizing resources, right? So our, peop- our people, our teachers are ingenious, you know, in, in, in that aspect. Um, so for, for as long as uh, you've been in, in, in your education journey, you also mentioned the church. That means the church has been a pivotal part of your life. Have you always yes. been a member of the church and a part of the the, the, the church in, in your community? Correct. I I think I got into the church in uh, 1986 at the young age. Uh, my okay. mom uh, introduced me to yes. Christianity. And by then the whole family was not part of the formal Christian church. Okay. Uh, so it, it was on a personal reason because, you know, Sometimes when you get sick, you're going to get uh, some help as medicine. And if something doesn't heal, then yes. the other option is to seek spiritual powers Okay. as African. So he he was of the view that what is ailing my son is is beyond the normal conventional uh, sickness that could be treated. So she okay. took me to the church and seen that I've remained part of the church. Whether in uh, in a leadership position or just as a member of the congregation, okay, uh, that's how it has been since 1986. Okay, okay, yeah, that's really good. So, um, let's get back into the education side. Uh, what is the name of the last book you read? Ah, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I. Uh, the book that I am reading now, mm-hmm. the, the last book that I write, uh, it is called the. Uh, it is called the. It, it is here. It is uh, Lazarus Rising by John Howard. Okay. It's a biography. A biography. Uh, by okay. The, yeah, he's the former Australian Prime Minister, and this is someone who has tried politics. With, with, you win, you, you lose, and then you won, mm-hmm. and then you went to leadership up as opposition leader. It's the same yes. setup as you have in, 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 in Canada. It is a universal yeah. system. So the prime okay. minister has to come from a majority party, and the party has to, to relax you as the leader of the party. So you tried the leadership, and he was knocked out from the leaderships, and then he came back. So he is a man who has persistently fought until he became the prime minister, and then Without expectation that he would win subsequent election, he remained between 1996 until 2007 in the leadership of the country, about 12 years. Uh, so, okay. an underdog position into a victor position. Okay. So, that is the book that I'm reading. Yeah. So, it's more a political memo than um, anything else, but yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, since the focus today is education, uh, let's get mm-hmm. right into it. Uh, tell us yeah. the story of Dufico. Maybe past, uh, first of all, let's start with the name Dufico. What inspired that name? Correct. Many people will wonder, and I think you will be, sit down with daddy, will be the first program to know exactly what is Dufico. Uh, Dufico, my middle name is Duan. Okay. So Dufico is Duan Family Investment Company. So okay. I, I took I took the first two letters of every single word and okay. put them together. So it was like out of a by drawing board and and it, and it sounded good to me. So I just okay. went with the names. Okay. <laughs> so that <laughs> so Dubico du- came into being in two thousand uh, in twenty eighteen. Okay. So it is actually the consultancy that I ran. And, okay. and my 
my part of what we do is mentoring young leaders within the mining sector. And then we extend that into a technical training, which we now trying to use to impact more lives in our own country, back where we come from, and the okay. first generation of migrants yeah, okay. in Australia. Yeah, so, so why a polytechnic? Why not a conventional college, for example? Correct. Uh, for those South Sudanese and non-South Sudanese who have been to Africa, or if you have not, people mm -hmm. would have heard of Africa. Look, I believe that um, you should start where you are or in what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a technical person, as a mining engineer and as a data science expert. Yeah. Uh, I'm always dealing with technical uh, stuff, whether projects or whether work, and even a research work, which has a technical aspect to it, being explained in a simple way. That's how it's supposed to be. So okay. when we started uh, Dufico with my wife in 2018, we have remained in the mining sector. And one okay. part which I've realized that impact the society is the technical area. You are okay. sitting there in your room. I'm sitting here. If this bulb in front of me blow up now, it will need a handyman to come and fix it. If yes. this mic, as we were trying it, if it doesn't work for whatever reason, we need someone with a bit of electronic background to fix mm -hmm. it. So I've been visiting Juba and my hometown abroad. Yeah. You see, our country depends a lot more on uh, foreign workers in a technical area. If mm -hmm. you need a plumber, if you need um, an electrician, if you need a carpenter, if, if you need a builder, a, a mason, mm -hmm. you will notice that it has to be a Ugandan, Kenyan, Rwandan, or, or a Eritrean. Now, a country that comes out of war, it needs to be reduced. And people in the technical field are in the front line of rebuilding of the nation. South Sudan is in that phase of rebuilding. Unfortunately, yes. there has been a bit of a setback. Okay. Yeah, between 2030. So there is so many universities in Africa, in, in, in South Sudan. But there is very limited technical uh, colleges. Uh, okay. If you want, uh, I can say it's, it's specifically we have only seven vocational training centers. And the vacancies in, in the are whole not country. Really enough. In the yes. whole country, seven. I okay. I sit in in a forum which is normally chaired by the Minister of Higher Education. So we we normally sit in it and I'm part of the higher education team on how to improve higher education sector. So your your program came at the right time actually. And okay. this, this week that finished, we had two representatives who went to attend the conference in Juba. So okay. there is a serious need of a technical uh, field. Now, a bit of aspect which has a personal touch to it is this. I believe mm -hmm. that no one should be disadvantaged due to lack of technical know-how. That's why, mm -hmm. that's what I believe. As a migrant in Australia, there have been these sectors of economy that are booming and are growing more than others, and particularly the uh, natural resources sector. There are those one who have privilege to get into it. And there mm -hmm. are those who would want really, but they are mm -hmm. limited by technical know-how. That's the, how we came to build some training into our consultancy to mentor young okay. engineers. So that okay. is a bit of a personal type to, to difficult. Yes. Okay. So, so Dufico Polytechnic is uh, registered in South Sudan as a sole proprietorship or as a partnership? What business model have you developed for it? Correct. Uh, as I said, Dufico Group Limited is registered in Juba and okay. mostly concerned with consultancy and other sectors. We okay. have not been actually proactively so in the street of Juba, you will not be hearing of people, but people will be talking about Dubuco Polytechnic. So Dubuco okay. Polytechnic was sponsored as a way of impacting life. So it is yes. privately funded. Okay. But uh, we have what we call Dubuco Special Education, okay. which is a charitable organization incorporated here in Perth. Okay. That, okay. that is the wing that is funding it. Mm -hmm. 
uh, okay. at least from the members, which is us. So it's family okay. funding it at this stage. So, okay. but we want to transition that into where people could fund it or when it becomes self-sustainable. You ask okay. of the business model, we are yeah. a technical field. Uh, we want to take a model that we have seen in the Rivosco in Kenya. If you yes. happen to have been in Kenya, where yes. most of the students joining our polytechnic are basically rural in Bor. Bor okay. is not as bustling as Juba. So mm-hmm. those those who are with the money are in Juba. They are in Uganda, is studying in Uganda. Those with the monies are in Rwanda, doing the technical courses in Kenya. So those who are in, in Bor and other rural setup are vulnerable. They don't mm-hmm. have that capacity for port fees. And based on our philosophy that no one should be left behind due to lack of technical education, and we mm-hmm. thought those would be the right people. So okay. the model is our student will learn practical uh, skill and mm-hmm. be able to start creating job for themselves. So if you are in a carpentry workshop, produce tables and benches, sell mm-hmm. those tables, and a living, and fund your own studies. That is the model we have built into it. It okay. is, it has been very slow. Roll okay. it out because of funding. You could imagine the level of funding required, but the college is open as we speak and our first okay. student is start on the 1st of November. Yeah. This year. Oh, okay. So, so the college, uh, was open this year and it's already running. Yes. The college is started the construction mm-hmm. of the infrastructure. It started uh, earlier in, actually late last year. Okay. But the first few students that we recruited, we have we have to set up the lab. As you are okay. here and I'm here, people with the with the technical know-how, people who can see them are living either outside the country or mm-hmm. in other localities within the country like Ziba. So we yes. don't want ourselves to be limited by rural setup. So we have to start with the IT lab, with the computer lab. Okay. And the lab was equipped and our IT student, those one who are doing the computer uh, training, mm-hmm. are sitting in the lab now. So we start with them. January, okay. February, we will have other courses such as carpentry starting. Because there okay. is a bit of El Nino projected, which actually we produce a report for it. So we okay. slow down construction in the rural area and access to it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so, um, how about the running aspect of it? Because you are the the person behind it. So who runs it down there? Do you have a principal? Do you have teachers? Or how does it go? Uh, good question. Um, we have a, a, a project team. And uh, we alternate with my wife earlier in the year. Okay. My wife from spent time there to make sure the project is up and running. Because okay. we own the vision. Uh, okay. We have been very careful in recruiting okay. people. So we bring in people who share our vision. So we okay. have a team, but as I speak to you, I'm always virtually and constantly with them. So okay. we make sure we have the internet on the facility. So we have the internet. Okay. So okay. we are be- pretty much involved. The only thing that we may not be physically there. So we have yet a leadership team on the ground. Okay. Full-time so on a- average, how many how many employees do you have on average? On average, uh, we have the eleven employees and four okay. contractors. Okay. Those are I call them contractors because these are people who are actually coming to us every now and then, and they've been with us in twenty twenty one. Okay. When we start the concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow, that's that's good. You've you've taken a big step, and um, it will make a very big difference in the community. You know. Um, yes. So I I'll, I would like to find out from you. Um, was it easy to get the, the the polytechnic registered in South Sudan, or what were some of the things you had to do to operationalize it? And did you face any major hurdles in the process? Good question. We are going through the process as we speak. Okay. Uh, the, of registration. One okay. thing, which is unfortunately for a country that is supposed to attract investors, supposed to develop, a country where it is very costly to register a business is Sudan. 
just a business. Leave alone the education. Now, when it comes to our education sector, the new minister is trying to improve things. And that's why okay. we sit in a team. We have, a, I have also a colleague who tried to start a high education college. And, and, and it's very difficult. And for a good reason. You see, when the South Sudan got independent until 20, uh, by 2011, between yes. 2005 and 2011, there were over 34 public, in, uh, in, sorry, universities in South Sudan. Okay. Only five are public. The rest, yeah. most of them were deemed to be bogus. Okay. So the quality had to be controlled. So yeah. now they reduced them to four. Four private yeah. universities plus uh, five public universities. Now, where I have a concern, which we have raised with the ministry and they are reviewing in, in a team, is mm -hmm. for you to register a high education um, institution, the, the requirement are all beyond what you require in Canada. Okay. Extremely beyond what you require in the U.S. For example, Daddy, if mm -hmm. for me to register a college difficult for the academy, I'm yes. required to own a land size of 250,000 square meters. Okay. It's like the whole village. Just imagine, it's like 500 meters by 500 meters. Wow. It's bigger yeah. than any of the non university you would have there in Edmonton. I, I, I don't. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is ridiculous. Now, mm -hmm. in this country, you have seen universities mm -hmm. that could just be simply one building. Yeah. But what matters is the quality, right? The quality yes. is what matters. It's not the size of the land. It's not the thousand of the student. But for whatever reason, the regulation yeah. in South Sudan, that is one simple example. Apart from other parameters required uh, okay. to, to make. Mm -hmm. So we we have two components. Because we are technical, we are part of general education. So someone to have a certificate carpentry is not going to be uh, someone having a degree in, uh, in mm -hmm. building and construction. Two different levels of registration. So we have yes. we have gone through the first phase. We are good. It's in the general education for our certificate and carpentry courses and things uh, mechanical to go on. For the diploma yeah. courses, that is where we have kept. Okay? okay. We are okay. not building the capacity for degrees at the moment. We are okay. going to go through those hurdles of big land. Our community make it so hard to get mm -hmm. land in South Sudan. Trust me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very political, emotive issue. Mm -hmm. I've been to Yuba several times. So yeah. yes, it's not easy and mm -hmm. they should rethink it. That's the challenge and the minister is working on it. Too. Of course, okay. that's what I've been told in the forum. Okay. So um, th there's there's also the problem of misconception on education yeah. in, in 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 South Sudan and many other African countries. For for example, yeah. uh, girls, you know, like why do you want to send your girl to school when you can marry her off and get like thirty cows or something like that? So mm -hmm. have you faced some of those problems? What what is the nature of your population of students? Are there more boys or more girls? Um, when we open our doors on the first, our first class, yes, I think uh, the number of boys has outnumbered the number of girls. Okay. Uh, I, I, based on the enrollment that I have received so far, okay, I've seen five girls in, in my in my school technique for the clinical courses. Only five. Okay. Uh, the, the, the leadership is we are putting the data together to see what, what, what are the motivational factors. Now, okay. when it comes from that, I don't think someone is intentionally limiting them in South Sudan, but it is the underlining traditional sexual setup that is limiting them. So officially now, South Sudan freedom should be, uh, education is accessible to all genders. Okay. But there is this setup of the families that make it hard. Okay. For a, for, for a girl child to access the education compared to a boy child. For example, let's say a girl child may be more involved in domestic house chores compared to a boy. So that mm -hmm. setup is limiting. So it's kind of indirect. When it comes to misconception, 
it's not actually an issue of gender that people in vocational are facing. It is the issue of what is the understanding of the vocational or technical training compared mm-hmm. to a conventional university setup. Every African child wants to have a degree in journalism, in communication, a degree in law, in medicine. So the technical area is facing a, a challenge of trying to create a bit of a, a sensitization of the community. Mm-hmm. Why it is critical for the economic and social growth of the society. So, yes, yes girl child enrollment is pretty low. That is true. Okay. That is okay. a fact. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and you, you feel like the ministry could do something? Um, what, what are some of the motivations that you can put in place to encourage more girls to come? Uh, good question. Uh, the way we run our... Okay. Apparently, we... Our workplace is pretty balanced. Okay. The little, the little organization we run. Yes. Uh, my wife and I run it equally. And our recruitment... Mm-hmm. is based on the competency. Because okay. we are starting, okay, we cannot yes. afford laxity. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, and the resources are very tight. So we, you need, we you want need to value for your money. Yes, and the resources are limited. So um, th- we find that, uh, and this is the fact, I find the female workers more loyal. Okay? Okay, yeah. Uh, then based on my experience, okay, the man, okay, uh, 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 it, 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 why? Because they have that bit of naturally ingrained setup. Female want to look for perfection. They want to do one job, do it perfectly before they move on. Men are more aggressive. And that's why you see men going up the ladder. It's okay. Yeah. So, what we want to do for the day, we want to make sure our female workers are in the forefront of encouraging mm-hmm. uh, the, the Delta to, yeah. to, to, to be part of the technical uh, training. I, I have not received uh, an attitude of you know, don't, don't want to get involved. No, there is that desire, all the sexual factors. So our mechanism is having an example, setting an example of female workers to be within mm-hmm. the polytechnic in order yeah. to be exemplary and act as role model. I think uh, that is what every organization should uh, use. Okay. Let, let the living example speak by itself than uh, mere campaign. Yeah. Okay, so c- civil war has wrecked our country apart, South Sudan. Um, since mm-hmm. 2013, things have not been really good. And the casualties include the many schools that we have vandalized mm-hmm. and so much has happened to them. So many children are not really learning. Uh, so people have gone back to learning under trees again. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think should be done to make sure that these unnecessary wars don't come up so that peace is given a chance and then also so that the country can prosper. Uh, Colleges like yours can get to teach students who then go out to become technical people who can develop those, you know, companies that can make furniture, can build, you know, things that can bring them money. What do you think should be done for the long term for the prosperity of the country in terms of Peace and then also in terms of education. Um, good questions. Uh, some are within the control of uh, common men like you and I. So okay. Answer to it, but some are within our. First thing we have all to preach peace. That is within our control. Okay. We have to preach peace. We have to show love for one another as sustenance at at our level, at the ordinary level. Mm-hmm. And, but there is no man is an island. That's yes. one thing. You see, mm-hmm. the, the concept of the big, big tree of suppression. Yes. If that theory is applied, it could be someone can just say that daddy is six degrees of suppression away from President Tree. Mm-hmm. If that theory is applied literally, what yeah. it means you may know someone who knows somebody who knows somebody at the influential position. So yeah. if 
we start making peace among ourselves, we cannot afford another war. That is the fact. The reason we cannot afford another war, the country is technically insolvent. I'm sorry to say. It is technically insolvent. Why? It's yes. The money, there's no enough money to go around, run the economy. Okay. Imagine having another war to, to fund again using the mega resources. Yeah. The country will be on its knees. Why? Because the first war 2013 to 2018, yeah. it broke the oil sector. Now, Sudan is at war. It has a knock-on effect on South Sudan. Yeah. What what the politician does, it is the common man that suffer. Mm-hmm. Okay? Because they will have their children in high-rises in, in, in Nairobi, in Uganda, in, in Juba, actually. Yeah, they will always fight in, in Juba, but that's where their asset are. So they will make sure Juba had to come to, to quietness very quickly compared to other parts of the South. So okay. what we want is everyone has to preach peace. That is within our. What the politician have to do, they have to be accommodative and compromising. Because at the end of the day, we are all socialists. And everyone is a stakeholder. No one has more stake in South Sudan than any other one. We are all equal shareholders within that the local location called South Sudan. Mm-hmm. Why do I think so? Anything that sounds like a war again, it is scare away potential investors in the nation. Yeah. And you need a, a foreign investment. The inflow of foreign investment is critical, and that's why you see countries like Kenya, yeah. Rwanda, advancing. Yeah. So peace is the primary ingredients of development. That's okay. what you can say. They are talking mm-hmm. of 2024 election and things like that. Yeah. Personally, I don't care whether they have election or they don't. Okay. What I care about is, provided they don't go to war, because whether they have election or they don't have election, yeah. <laughs> what difference does it make to <laughs> common man? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and how okay. would you know whether the election was election or not the election? I okay. don't know whether you know <laughs> Okay. To me, okay. so I don't care is provided they have peace in the country. Okay. Okay. Yeah, L- let's let's get back to Ajak the man. So you yep. you you have a PhD now. What has been the biggest motivation for you to pursue that uh, route for you to go for the PhD? Um out of curiosity. Okay. Nothing else but out of curiosity. Why? Yeah. Because I've been very curious about things. I've been very curious to know more, to demonstrate that this one works that way or doesn't work. Uh, my interest has always been about decision-making processes. Okay. How do people make decisions? So, and within the organization where I've worked, I've mm-hmm. realized some people would be at the top of the food chain. Yeah. But if you look at them, are they the smartest? Mm-hmm. Or are they the most loyal? Or th- there's always something that has propelled them to the top, right? It, it, what what is that? So I went and because being an engineer, I could not go and do all these other psycho uh, psychological related uh, training or social sciences where you want to analyze people's behavior. So okay. I. I try to understand the decision-making processes and why some leaders at the top are so fearful and why they don't always take decisions that are good for the long-term investment of the shareholders. So I went and studied a concept called real option in decision-making and, okay. and particularly in engineering uh, and applied to engineering setup, engineering okay. design. So it's okay. all about fear and certainty. So my... It, it is the inquiry mind. I'm being very inquisitive to know why is it that some companies do well, some don't, and why some companies survive. Um, okay. 
it's okay. So, events so, uh, like all this. Mm-hmm. So is is that what your PhD thesis was based on? Um, decision making at the highest level? Yes, it, it, it was my uh, my project was the application of the real option into decision making and uh, in decision making and uh, and engineering designs. And okay. I focus on mining investment. So it's okay. still technical. Yes. But it, it is that process that is being analyzed quantitatively rather okay. than uh, qualitatively. So okay. you still have to apply all modeling the decision uh, processes into okay. real mathematical equation and see them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> into, okay. Translate them into numbers. So yeah, that's yeah. what it is. So it's still in mining and metallurgical engineering and apply it across the engineering and, and, and see why some managers destroy value and some create value. Yeah. But it's come down to that concept of fear. All of that translated to so many numbers. Yeah. So uh, uh, am I am I right to think that you know um most PhD holders in South Sudan aspire for political office so now that you are Dr Ajak Dwanya Jack are you going to be the chairman of the political party that we talked about in Kakuma so I can become your secretary general <laughs> No uh unfortunately that is uh, I think it is a myth and it need to be busted and it is a myth that has okay. taken root in our society okay. as socialists. Uh, okay. Th- what you are saying is what many people believe. And But to tell you the truth, I know so many of my colleagues who had PhDs, but they remain in their field. Okay. I- I'll tell you what. Mm-hmm. When you go into politics as a PhD and you have not practiced in your field, yeah. you are not adding more value to society. Okay. Why? Because... PhD is about contributing to knowledge, universal knowledge. That's what it's supposed to be. Uh, mm-hmm. That's why they are the one leading uh, research frontier. They are mm-hmm. the one uh, coming up with a policy briefing and this long document. That is what it's supposed to be. You are contributing to universal knowledge. And you, okay. and you are sharing that knowledge with the student and impacting it. That's mm-hmm. where it's supposed to be. Does it mean PhD people don't go to politics? No, they sh- they sh- they have the right like any other citizen to participate in politics. They have all the right. Uh, is it the PhD that is taking them there? No. Some are driven by the view that they think they could make it much better. So mm-hmm. they are like any other one. But because okay. being a, a, a PhD holder in a country called Sudan and now South Sudan, it yeah. comes with a bad connotation. Because mm-hmm. there are the cases where PAD yeah. become more prominent with a certain political alignment that people, majority, may not uh, try to align to. But okay. So, in short, I, I think I'm more mechanical uh, than having to participate in politics. And, and where okay. is the politics, by the way? In which country? Because if I want to participate <laughs> in politics, I should start here in Australia or you start in, in Canada, Daddy, okay, I think. Okay, because so okay. we don't live in South Sudan, so we can't yeah. be involved in the politics of the country that we don't live and be part of. So, yeah, so, yeah in short, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess many people believe in East or West home is best. So one foot in Australia, one foot in South Sudan. But that's a question for another day. Let, let, let me... Let me take you more um, into into the education thing uh, because you have business back home. Yeah. I'll consider Dufiko Polytechnic your business now, if that's okay. So in South Sudan, yeah. teachers are some of the most poorly paid and irregularly paid too, you know? Mm-hmm. So to motivate your staff at Dufi, uh, Dufiko Polytechnic, how do you mm-hmm. deal with that problem? Are you giving them enough so that they always come back to work or... How do you deal with it? Okay. I'll give you... How do you... Do you, do you know that a minister in South Sudan yes. paid the equivalent of 60 US dollars for a minister? Okay. The salary of a minister is about 60 yes. US dollars. Equivalent to 60 so, US dollars. Yes. So, now you wonder... How can they afford electric cars and things like that? Mm-hmm. 
that is that is an inquiry. Maybe someone may need to research that. Okay. But that is what it is. Okay. Now to answer your question. Yes. The the only sector that pay high in South Sudan, that's why everybody is dying to get into people are running yes. away working for the government. Yes. It is the not actually it is the non governmental organization. Okay. They pay very well. Uh I took time to study because we want to be competitive. As I mm-hmm. said, we are focused on quality rather than quantity. Right? Yeah. That we get people who stay and remain with us because they are the future to grow. Uh, what we started. This is an idea that needs to be built. So, okay. if someone has in in the military in South Sudan, yeah, someone with a seven star general. The seven star general is called uh, what? Uh, how do they call it? It is it is it brigadier general? Uh, I'm I'm not good with those military terms. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it is called uh, a brigadier, brigadier general. Maybe? Yeah, major general is six, isn't it? Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Major General is seven stars. Yes. Okay. It's, it's Major okay. General. Okay. Is it? Because Major is six. Yeah. So it's some, Major General, I think. Some of the audience might might know, so they'll put them in the comment section. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I think it is Major General. Now, okay. the reason I bring it into question is. Yes. I think, um, my some of our employees who who are in the almost to the bottom okay do very well than a major general in the south sudan army oh, okay that's how much i can say <laughs> oh, okay okay but I, I'm, i'm not comparing the old paid i'm comparing the current increment yeah so, so, so in, uh, in other so words the, yeah the question is yeah. so do, do you pay your staff in south sudan is pounds or in dollars Be, because no, then so because that they don't run away to the to to the non-governmental organizations, right? Yeah, what do we do? That, that's a, that, that's the first question. And uh, and those listeners, uh, anyone who may be interested in working for us in the future, need to consider this. Mm-hmm. We index our pay to US dollars. Okay. The the reason we index it to US dollars is this. Uh, South Sudanese pound is very unpredictable. Okay. So you, if if you pay somebody hundred thousand three months ago, that hundred thousand may be equivalent of I don't know ninety five or eighty US dollars today. It it, it okay. keeps differentiating with losing value. So in yeah. order to uh, avoid uh, to caution, in order not to uh, expose our workers to this yeah. fluctuating currency. We yeah. index it to US dollars. So what okay. we do at the end of the pay period, uh, at the start of the pay period, at the payroll yeah. season, if you are yeah. being paid, you just see what is the what is the the, the, the pound doing in the market. So yeah. if you are hundred dollars yesterday, if it was hundred thousand yesterday, and today is one hundred and fifty thousand, you simply yeah. get one hundred and fifty thousand. Then you yeah. don't have to worry about what the dollar is doing to the pound in the market. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think that is one thing that has created a bit of happiness to for our workers because yeah. they don't have to worry about the stress, the pound, and the dollar is fluctuating. No, they don't have to worry about that. Okay. Yes, we take care of that. Okay. Okay. That's, that's so in other words, we we quant- we give contract in US dollars. That's what okay. We, okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that that that's the answer. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's that's good because then that way it motivates them, right, to stay. Because I believe you have a long term mm-hmm. plan to 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 keep the college going. So that's good. Um. So yeah. for the long term, also in terms of South Sudan, the vision of the South Sudan Higher Education Policy Framework for twenty twenty one twenty twenty five is to provide accessible, quality, relevant, inclusive education, training, and research for a prosperous, productive, and innovative nation. That will ensure yep. that higher education institutions like yours uh, meet the knowledge, competencies, skills, quality, you know, that nurtures South Sudanese values and prospers the country. What is the reality of the policy on the ground? Because you are actually a foot soldier in terms of that. Do you get a sense that the educator um, is creating um, the environment or the government is creating the environment that will ensure the uh 
the, the, the policy framework from the government is really achievable for the long term within this uh, period, 2021-2025? Um, well, let's say we are a couple of weeks away from 2024. Okay. So 2025, you can technically say it's 13 months away. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Uh, the vision of higher education 2025, uh, 2021-2025 uh, was articulated by the higher education minister, uh, Honorable Gabriel Johnson. Yes. And, and he's part of the forum. And he just concluded a conference last week, actually, on the 27th of a higher education. Okay. And we are planning a conference together jointly with them. I'm part of the team here. Okay. In the diaspora. Yeah. Uh, we are planning to join hand with them in Viva sometime next year. Okay. The idea is to operationalize that vision. That vision line up with the social and uh, 2040 vision. Okay. And the 2040 vision is said that South Sudan want to be to create a nation that is informed, educated, and in, an informed nation. That is vision 2040. Educated and informed nation. That okay. vision has to be backed up with resources. Okay. Yeah. What is yeah. happening on the ground is the vision is good, well articulated, but at the mechanism to implement it. Need a bit of of of, uh, of the funding, and and I think okay. it goes beyond the ministry itself. It has to be the holistic approach from the government side of things, considering the financial constraints which the government has been going through. Yeah, we are here to see how that vision uh, impact the ordinary life in the street of town in in South Sudan. Yeah, that vision too. Have to be accommodative of the fact that the, the country does not have enough facility to accommodate. For example, tell you, as you, we have eligible student number of students who should go to university each year, mm-hmm. finishing some school, it would be about a million. Okay. Finishing some school, okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, not not finishing secondary school, but student enrolling in uh, secondary school each year. In re- okay, me. enrolling, yeah. Yep. Uh, the capacity at the current universities within the whole nation, within the whole nation, the capacity, mm-hmm. the 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 university with the largest share is Juba University. Okay. And the capacity it could take between nine, nine to fifteen thousand. Kind of. Okay. Okay. There was one report that uh, done by Professor John Kate. By 2021, yeah, the whole source done was in the universities. It had a role over 32,000 for the university. Okay. okay. But the clinical colleges are only taking less than 3,000 to be precise, 2,400 students. Okay. Now, let's say if the capacity each year. Of all the public and private universities, is only thirty-two thousand to forty thousand. Assume they yeah. have a room to expand it to fifty thousand. Yeah, I believe that is a total number of students which one university in Canada. Yeah, can take, but that is for the whole nation. So okay. what does that mean? The vision of twenty twenty-one to twenty-five. I think it is a roadmap, mm-hmm. and it may take time to get there. So okay. on the ground. I don't see uh, uh, whether there is enough infrastructure yeah. uh, to to support it uh, in the whole country. Yeah. Uh, but the vision is good. I think the, gov- the, the the ministry and the government are looking for resources, and especially the ministry is looking for resources. It's okay. expanding the network. It's building partnership. It's stakeholders okay. are being consulted, and I think that's where we found ourselves into it. So, okay. Uh, okay. It is doable, okay. but it may yeah. take a bit of pain and hard work to get it. Okay. Yeah. Nothing comes easy, right? It always takes sweat. Mm-hmm. So we we all hope for the best. So your institution is based in a pastoral community in South Sudan, you know, um, where there's a lot of back and forth movement in the families, you know, because of the the cattle keeping. Uh, I know Boris is more urban, so it's it's a little bit different sometimes. So being a private uh, institution, how then have you um, 
earmarked or have you made sure that Dufico Polytechnic is sustainable and profitable in the long term? Yes. Um, like any other capital projects, it's, it's starting uh, Dufico Polytechnic has been a, a capital intensive affair.